Welcome, everybody, to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I, of course, am David Goss. Alongside me is my family members in soccer. Our bond is stronger than a partnership or any law firm in the world. Matt Doyle <laughs> and Kalen Carr himself preparing to come out of retirement and play on Wednesday night for the Houston Dynamo against LAFC. Yes, Tom, that is a scoop. Breaking news to start Extra Time. Kalen, how's the hamstrings feeling? Not great. I will need to find the helmet, um, and I am coming to Houston on Wednesday. That actually, yeah, that part play. is true. I will not be playing. <laughs> I will not be playing. I'll be hanging out with Susanna Collins, maybe somewhere in hopefully some sort of luxury box suite. No, nah, I'll be out in the crowd. Have my beer. Uh, Man of the I'm people, Caleb. I'm going to steal no. Ching's seat and hope somebody gives me a free beer. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be fun. So, yeah, hoping for Kaylin, if they if they dropped you into the game, right? No. How many minutes can you give him? How many <laughs> no, minutes no, no, can you no, give no, him? No, 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 Houston, August, right now, what, it'll be September 1st, maybe? Uh, no. August 31st. No, uh, yeah. no, no, no minutes. I've done that in the past. Those days are okay. well behind, yeah. All right. Men's well, until I die. Kalen, I will say one of my favorite moments of ETR over the last few months is we rattled off, I think at one point, all the teams Philly blew out, and you unconsciously threw up the H and said, shout out Houston when we mentioned the Dynamo. <laughs> so it's, I just know how ingrained the love for the club hey, is. I'm you? feeling better about this. Philly's just mopping teams up. Yeah, so it's like, true. we're spreading, they're spreading the love. So I'm, I even forgot that it's the, Dy the Dynamo had that result. It's not, yeah, it's not just standard game. operating procedure at this point. We will talk about that coming up from the five AT&T 5G virtual studios. We will, of course, talk about Austin's epic win on Friday night, as well as Portland's big win. We will sort of uh, handicap who the MLS Cup true contenders are, as well as what the Supporter Shield race looks like, which, of course, Philly Union are heavily involved in. And then we're going to go down to the line. We're going to talk Western Conference playoff race, Eastern Conference playoff race, which is pretty much every team from 2 to 14 at this point. Uh, we will put some teams to bed early as they, we will close the book on their season that we don't see making it. And we will, of course, focus on some of the teams who are very close to making it. Let's start, though, with the best thing we saw in Week 27. And for you, Kalen, it's a little bit of a preview of what you will look like in the Houston Dynamo LAFC game on Wednesday night because you <laughs> are no longer a finisher. You don't care about the forwards anymore. For you, it's all about the setup. If you want to get on the pitch... Find the pass to the star player. That's the moral of the story. <laughs> and there were some good ones this weekend. Uh, Fagundes had a really nice one where he kind of outside of the right. Um, that was that was high up for me. Uh, Pouge to Chicharito, insane, off the chest, kind of side volleys it, basically right into his path. Um, Doyle, I think that was your pass of the week, though, right? Yeah, that was that one. I'll tell you, in that game, Chicharito had the assist on the first goal, also off a through ball. And like, as soon as Chicharito had that, I was like, that's going to be my pass of the week for the column. And I was cutting it. <laughs> and like five minutes later, Pooch, yeah, our, our boy Ricky, um, man, you can't give him that kind of room in, in central midfield because he, he will cut you up. And so, yeah, sick. that was my pass of the week. Kevin. Sick, sick, sick. I, I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going Lucho Acosta to Vasquez because the funniest part about it is uh, Vasquez actually points to Lucho to play it out wide because he sees he doesn't feel there's an angle. So he's like, get it out wide, then make, we can whip it in. And <laughs> Lucho's like, no, no, I'm, I see an angle. It's right in the middle, like right down the fairway and actually plays it through uh, the Columbus center back's legs and it goes right in for um, a really nice finish. So, uh, yeah, I'm giving the shout out to Lucho. But, yeah, passes were um, on point over the weekend. So there's so, some good Kayla ones. Kalen, let me ask you this, because you were you were a forward when you played in MLS, but now um, you're an elder statesman. You're more of a pure number 10 in mm. men's league. He's making so, the Wayne Rooney move. Right. So right, when you were watching that Cincinnati game, did you see that pass unfold as Lucho did? Were you like, oh, this is simple, just a <laughs> nutmeg through ball straight into the forward stride? I don't know why anybody else doesn't see this. Um, yeah, first of all, everybody at men's league is a number 10. So it's, <laughs> it's just, that's the part of the problem. Not, um, David, Goss. <laughs> yeah. Not David Goss. Yeah, I have played with Goss. Yeah, he's. I'm more of a Kai Wagner now, though. Big distribution <laughs> yeah, numbers from the fullback position. Uh, I did not Doyle. see that pass. <laughs> no, Doyle, bes so. besides the pass, 
I think yeah. you were quite you enjoyed the Cincinnati Columbus I enjoyed that was the, real game the, too. I, yeah, I the whole game was great. I enjoyed the post game. Um, this league doesn't have enough uh, sort of forward facing villains, and uh, Caleb Porter has really embraced that role in the Hell Is Real Derby. Uh, you know, shushing the Cincinnati fans after uh, Columbus got their I think it was ninety sixth minute equalizer. Um, and like like the whole stadium just goes deadly silent, whistle blows, and Caleb walks out there shushing the entire stadium. That prompted a reaction, uh, right? Like some idiots were throwing stuff on the field, which like, never, ever, ever do that. There's never a cause for that, um, and I'm glad nobody got hurt. But even that had moments where, like, somebody threw a half-empty beer at Cucho, he caught it out of the air, and he just, like, crushed the <laughs> remaining half of, <laughs> of the beer. Um, and it was like, look, this is why rivalry games are better, right? Like, like th- these types of – the type of emotion that was on display um, from both teams and obviously from both fan bases, you know, the videos that were coming out after that game were spectacular. Uh, and Caleb was willing to play the heel. It was great. I, and, like, I, it was great TV – on the back of two hours of a really fun soccer game. That was the best thing I saw this weekend. Uh, it's, I don't think a coincidence that Pat Noonan, who has shown very little emotion, he's been very steady throughout the season, even in some wild moments. Four three wins, four three losses, three goal leads going away. He's dropping F-bombs in the postgame presser after watching Caleb shush his fans on his field. Like I think Caleb deserves 50% of that fine that's coming uh, Pat Noonan's way just for – edging everyone and getting the entire atmosphere going. I love it. It feels like these two clubs sort of reset at the exact same moment of new stadium, new coaches, identities, Cucho, new villains, obviously Brandon Vasquez emergence, all of that. That one was a lot of fun. Um, We're going to talk more about those teams in a moment. But first, the best thing I saw this weekend, and what else am I going to say, but our 22 under 22 player of the week and presented by Body Armor, Warren, New Jersey's own 19-year-old Daniel Edelman rising to the occasion, scores his first goal uh, in his MLS career. He sat on the bench for a while to start the year. Frankie Amaya emerged as one of the best center mids in MLS. Drew Yearwood has taken a step forward. You already knew Christian Casares would be a big-time starter. Lukinas has been a huge factor for them as well so it didn't feel like there was minutes and he hung around he trained he continued to push continued to believe in himself he led the u20s to their championship down in central america and has returned and has elevated his game pretty much every time he has stepped on the field had a good performance against atlanta got a red card against barcelona which is like just counts as a point in life because that's a thing (laughs) he's always going to be able to say especially when he's playing for barcelona as the next sergio busquets on the field, and then he gets the goal in this one in a must-win game. Red Bulls went down 1-0. Obviously, they get the red card uh, from Pasuelo, which helps, but this was a must-win game for a team that struggled at home and has struggled in general, and if they had lost this game, they would have come down into the will-they-make-the-playoffs conversation rather than will-they-get-a-home game. Uh, So it was massive, and shout-out to him, and I'm sure the 87 members of his family that drove the 25 minutes from (laughs) Warren, New Jersey, to get there. I'm sure the tailgate was electric for the Edelman family, both pre- and post-game for this one. So congrats to him, and it has to be mentioned, obviously, former Red Bull 2 player doing things yeah, like it, other Red Bull you, The greatest yeah. team in the world, Obviously. according to uh, David. I don't know. The Jersey like, mentions on this show, with Anders gone today, so no no Seattle issues, although I, it was at the very top I mean, of the Seattle's, run, Seattle's, Seattle's <laughs> gone. Seattle's gone too, Caitlin. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> oh, ouch. But no, like, like, in, in all that, David, like we should say congrats to the – we're not going to do a lot on the Red Bulls in this show, but like congrats to the Red Bulls because they're going to make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. It's 13 straight years. The record was set last year by the Sounders, 13 straight years in the playoffs. It's absolutely remarkable consistency in a league um, that is often anything but. Uh, so to do that, and like three weeks ago, it looked kind of iffy. And now it's like, oh, man, they might climb up to third place. Um, so they've they've turned a lot of stuff around. They're playing good ball. Well, they weren't playing great ball until Pozuelo's uh, <laughs> Nigel Deshong red card. Um, but after that, they absolutely just buried Miami. And, Kalen, just so you know, New Jersey, 
I trash it when I can, but I rep it when I want to. It's the most beautiful thing as a Long Islander to be I able thought to you were do. From, I thought you were from New Jersey. Yeah, so yeah, did I. Sure. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Kalen's believable. I believe that Kalen would think I'm from New Jersey, and in explaining <laughs> I'm from Long Island, would still think I'm from New Jersey. No, Doyle no, no, doesn't no. get to do that. Doyle. Uh, UConn teaches you enough geography that you know. <laughs> it, te- it teaches me a lot about Long Island. I was going to say, say that. you got to know what's on the other side of that sound because that would be Michael. pretty bad. Let's dig in to the weekend. It started out in perfect fashion. Friday night, the doubleheader. Austin hosting LEFC 2 versus 1 in the Western Conference and then Portland hosting Seattle on national TV. And Austin FC, they were aware of the start time of this game LAFC maybe less so, and Austin FC came flying out of the gates. They were all over LAFC. Diego Fagundes with one of the best goals of the weekend off the free kick. But Doyle, it was so much more than that. They were first every 50-50. They chose where the game was played. They dominated possession. It just, in I had questioned all week, let's build this game up and treat it like a playoff game. Let's see what a new club does. And they answered every single one of those questions. They did, and I'll say that it wasn't just they were first to every 50. They were first to every 40-60. Uh, I mean, they came out, and Josh Wolf talked about it after the game. Steve Terundolo talked about it after the game. Like, tactics matter. Um, talent matters. Uh, but sometimes, and it was the case in this game, one team is just way more up for it than the other team. And in those situations, invariably, the team that's way more up for it um, walks away with the three points. And that was, I mean, it was just the case. There were two really hard challenges by Austin, like borderline yellows within the first 10 minutes. One of them was their number 10, Juicy, lay in the wood on, on Ryan Hollingshead. Um, like the types of, like playoff types of challenges. And there was no response to that from LAFC. And like, as soon as I saw that, I was <laughs> like, oh. Because I, I, I did kind of think that LAFC was going to run through them a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right, and Austin's a really good team. That they're where they are in the standings. It's not an accident, but they can be more open than the rest of the teams that I, I think of in the top, you know, sort of two tiers. They can let you play, and I thought that LAFC would find that space and sort of run through them. And as soon as those challenges happened, and as soon as Austin, like they were so tight, any time they lost the ball, they were so compact and just like going into, like, trying to win it right back. I was like, ooh, LAFC is going to be in some trouble. Uh, now, I didn't think it would end up being 4-1 type of trouble. Um, I didn't think it would be an hour of just complete dominance from Austin. But that's what it was. And it, like, it was not an aberration. They just they just laid the wood uh, on, on LAFC and were the much better team uh, through the competitive portion of this game. Austin FC... Um, obviously that huge moment, Kalen, in front of their fans for a newer team. This was, you know, as Doyle said, this was that statement. Uh, what was the statement to you as you watched it, as you experienced it? Like, did you walk away and say they are MLS Cup favorites after beating LAFC the way they did? Contenders? They've heard of it. Like, where do you sort of land after one <laughs> MLS regular season game? <laughs> I mean... We're, I think we're going to go through some MLS Cup as well as Supporter Shield sort of like resets looking towards this back end. Um, but for me, I, I think for Austin's sake, I was looking more towards the playoffs and if these two teams match up. Mm-hmm. And I think for an Austin team to go and have this type of performance, yes, at home where chances are they're likely going to have to go to Bank of California in the, in the playoffs. Where they but did this win will already. Give them, yeah, a good point. Um, they will feel much more confident as well having this result as of late with Bale, like with, and yes, I know this is Bale's first start and he didn't look really great. You know, like that, that front three, it's not, it's not just going to be as simple for LAFC as rolling them out. But then again, this is what you need for LAFC. It's not going to get there unless you play him and unless you commit to kind of building towards this back stretch. Um, but I, I, like when you go through the line, I mean, Aruti, two goals right but yep. I think he sort of was emblematic of in a way of just like being such a pest constantly being a nuisance yes he's he's streaky but and that can be in that can turn into two goals and he he applies the pressure on the second one where he gets that energy from the first applies the pressure to win the ball back then he ends up getting it where it kind of just scraps to kind of stay with it and then is able to round it and get the finish 
Um, so I just thought Austin, to Doyle's point, was just from like a energy motivation standpoint, really up for it and pushed the game to put be put on their terms. And I think it goes to show that if you're LAFC, yes, you can have all these wonderful pieces. I know they're adding more with the DP striker from San Etienne. Um, we don't know exactly when he's going to be ready to play, but those pieces all need to be fitting together. Um, and I do have some questions about how they defend in wide areas as well, too. I think in the last couple of weeks, there's been some issues with whether it's Hollingshead or Palacios. Um, Escobar didn't start in this one. I think there's some ways that teams are able to get after LAFC a little bit on the flanks. And when you have Bale in there as well on a flank, how much is he going to track back and defend? Vela's tucking inside often. So I think there's still some question marks where teams can look at. And for me, it just goes again to saying like, we can't just go ahead and crown LAFC as the MLS Cup champions. I still, you know, not to get it away from it, but I still think they're the favorites for the supporter shield. I think most people would say that. Um, but Philly and, and uh, we'll have something to say about that. And I think Austin, especially when you look towards the playoffs, Minnesota, I'd add to that, that group um, that's right up and around it. Uh, that could give LAFC on what on on its day a really tough match, and we saw that over the weekend. Yeah, it was awesome to watch. I mean, if you remember when LA when Austin won at LAFC, it was not this type of game. It was sit deep. No, they countered and scored on their two half chances. So it's impressive to see them now do this against the high level team in two different ways. And I think they showed they could play their soccer against the best team in MLS and dominate. Which means, in reality, if they are able to come in locked in and play well. Their soccer should work against anyone. The question becomes, can you do it four times in must-win games in the playoffs? Which, whew, LAFC getting smoked in this game after acquiring Bale and Chiellini and the whole world watching them was one of those, like, welcome first time. Like, this is MLS. Welcome to the show. It's chaos, and you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, 95, 95 degrees in Austin, <laughs> you know, 50% humidity. Like, this is not, yeah. It's, it's a different sort of challenge, and they did not look up for it, absolutely. So congratulations to Austin. Uh, epic game, epic moment. It is, I think, one of those special regular season games. As we go back, I, we get this question a lot from the people we work with. of like, what are regular season games that stand out? This will be one of those, I think, that Austin was able to elevate their game to do this. The argument and fight on the sideline, it had that little bit of extra bite, that little bit of extra energy. And right now, anything in Q2 Stadium feels special because of that atmosphere, that crowd. So congrats to those fans. Uh, we got a bunch of tweets asking us to just go live in like the middle of the Austin game to start <laughs> talking about it. I respect that. I understand what that feels like when your team does well and you just want people around the world to just live in it. Uh, and so you get your moment here. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, we talked MLS Cup contenders. So let's bring Philadelphia in here. Philadelphia Union, a 6-0 win this weekend over the Colorado Rapids. This is the fourth time they have beat a team by six goals. Not just this year, and not just, what, in the last six no, th weeks. This is, no, this is the fourth time that they've beaten a team by six or more goals in the past ten games. Right. So, so this is this year, yeah. And that is history, not to have done it in ten games, not to have done it in one year, oh, yeah. but to have done it in your history in Major League Soccer. The Philadelphia Union in the last 10 games have beaten a team by six goals more times than any franchise in MLS history has ever done it. I didn't and understand this And they gave other teams like a 14-year head start, too. Yeah. <laughs> DC United, LA Galaxy, the Revs, Columbus, they have not I done it. I would have guessed, like, I would have guessed <laughs> Atlanta did that over the course of... Yeah their first three years, right? Like, like, but, but no, and like, like you, I didn't understand this stat when I first saw, it. I think the, the Opta Jack uh, handle put it out. That's the Opta official MLS handle. They, they have all the historical stats, all the up-to-date stats, stuff like that. They put it out. And I thought I, I read it as like, Oh, they're the first team to do it in a single season. Wow. That's a, a pretty great accomplishment, especially because, you know, they had only scored 22 goals in their first 18 games, right? Two months ago, Jim Curtin was like, yeah, we, we lack that guy who can make magic. We lack that guy who can uh, break down a team. They made zero attacking signings. Zero attacking signings this summer. And they've gone from a team that scored 22 goals in 18 games to a team that has now set a record for the most 
six goal wins in MLS history by any team, period. No caveats on that. It's not over the course. Like, the Galaxy have done it three times since 1996. The Galaxy have won MLS Cups, like two more MLS Cups, than they've won games <laughs> by six goals. It's absolutely, like, I didn't realize, it. like, I knew that they were doing absurd stuff recently. I didn't realize the scope to which they were doing it. And I'll, I'm going to give you another stat here. There's only four teams in MLS history that have scored twice as many goals as they've allowed. League of parity, right? We see this type of all the time in, in, in Europe, but in MLS, it's very hard to double up. Uh, I think it was 2010 RSL, uh, 2017 uh, Toronto, uh, 2019 LAFC, mm-hmm. and the 2020 Union. 20, in that shortened season, the COVID shortened season, the Union won the Shield, and they did it by scoring uh, just over twice as many goals as they allowed. As it stands, the Union are on the verge of going three times. <laughs> they are they have 57 goals scored, 20 allowed. That's the second best defensive record in terms of goals allowed per game in MLS history right now. And they're scoring at a record-breaking clip as well. Like these, We've never seen numbers like this, like what the Union have done over the past couple of months. And it's, it's completely out of the blue because, again, they made zero summer signings for their attack. Zero. And, and here they are just smoking teams 6-0. It's unreal. But Doyle, if you sign an international player, I think the theorem states a year and a half later is when they really <laughs> hit their form. So Daniel Gazdog was the big summer signing they made for 2022. That's true. That's true. I mean, he's certainly playing like it right now. And man. as I understand it, the Golden Boot draw was for who would win Golden Boot, not combine goals. So I'm still in the running if Daniel Gazdog can just <laughs> catch up to Dreesy, which just means they'll play Atlanta United on Wednesday. That'll be 6-0, Gazdog hat trick, oh and then they're tied. So it's, it's pretty good for me. It, it all works out um, pretty well. It is astounding to hear the things that you say, Doyle, about them. And I did have a few fans tweet at me and say, well, you know, it's padding numbers. But who cares in the way in which defensively they're the best team in MLS and they have beaten all the other good teams. So it's not that they're padding numbers on points. It's that they're padding numbers on goal differential, yes, against some lower secondary teams. But that doesn't change the reality, which is they are the best team in the Eastern Conference. They are one of the two or three best teams in Major League Soccer, which brings us into our next conversation. How much higher in the standings can they get? So, for the Supporters' Shield race, as we come down to it, LAFC, which everyone anointed as winners, they are on 57 points with 27 games played. The Philadelphia Union are on 54 points with 28 games played. So, one more and three points behind. And Austin is on 51 with 27 played. So Austin on equal games, six points behind LAFC. If they did win that game in hand, they could equal Philly for second in the Eastern Conference. Do you want me to go through their schedules for everyone before we announce it? So Philadelphia chasing LAFC, those three points. They have, as I mentioned, Atlanta United at home on Wednesday night. They then travel to the New York Red Bulls next weekend. They then come home a week later and they host Orlando City on Saturday, September 10th. Remember, the U.S. Open Cup final for Orlando is on September 7th. So Orlando will be coming off the biggest game in their franchise's history midweek and then traveling up to Philadelphia. Philly then travels a week later to face off against Atlanta again, a team not in the playoffs. You then have an international break where they do play a Liga MX club. And then you come back on October 1st Philly goes to Charlotte, and on October 9th, Philly finishes at home on decision day against TFC. So that is the schedule for Philly. Here it is for LAFC. To close things out, they will be, of course, in Houston to face off against Kalen Carr on Wednesday night uh, this week. They then will travel home. They will host RSL. They then travel six days later, so one day less of rest, to Dallas 
to face off against Dallas. Then they play midweek their makeup game, which is on the road at Minnesota, who are one of the hottest teams in Major League Soccer. They then come back that weekend to host Houston. And then after the international break, they finish at the Portland Timbers, who will be in a playoff race, and on decision day at home against Nashville SC. So handicap it for me. Do the Union have a chance, or are they favorites in any way in this conversation? They've got a chance, for sure. I, I mean, when, I, when you go through that list to me, LAFC, uh, I think, has a little bit of a tougher schedule. Going to play in Houston, yes, I, I know Dynamo are not in a good place at all, but having to go to Houston, to Dallas, um, yeah, you get to Houston Minnesota. at home. Minnesota, the way they're playing right now, even, uh, I think, what do they say, Nashville on, the, on decision day? Yep. yep. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the other thing that I would put towards this is, like, while I, while I would expect LAFC to push and try to win the Supporters' Shield, that's not their ultimate goal. Um, so I don't, I don't know if they'll completely sell out to win each match. Like, for example, when you're integrating this front three, you're going to have to now make some decisions to play guys that are not just based on form. And because I think Doyle did a good job in, in his column looking at Opoku and saying how Opoku has been, you know, one of the more dangerous players and consistent right now. And I think there's going to potentially be a tough decision to say, how does he play? Arango, right? Are you going to drop him from the lineup? <laughs> He's made it virtually impossible to do that right now. But you have to integrate these guys to make some decisions. Getting Ilya back will be big. Um, I think, especially when I think about, the, I was talking about the play where they pick off that ball. Austin does in the middle of midfield. He's just so ball secure in, in that middle of midfield to them that he gives them a path out at times that they, they haven't had without him. Um, so I probably would still lean towards LAFC. Um, just because I think they, they have incredible depth. Uh, but I'm not going to go against Philadelphia to say that they don't have a chance at this thing because, one, when you mentioned Orlando in the Open Cup, I was like, you know that's going to go to overtime and penalties, right? Because that's just <laughs> life for Orlando and knockout tournaments. <laughs> like, it's just going to happen. It's going to be crazy. You mean uh, Tesho so that, time. That's, that's gonna... what we call extra time for <laughs> it Orlando. Is. It is, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't know. I just think when I look at those ones, even as far as the distance of travel and then the way that they've been able to use some of these younger players um, Philadelphia has, that's what kind of, I think, pushed them over the top a few years ago when they won the Sporter Shield. Um, and so I think that they could really make a run at this thing. And I think, I think it really could come down to the wire. Um, but I'd probably still lean LAFC. The one thing I will say for Philly looking towards Cup and. Uh, in these blowouts, they've only had one, I think, this this last one was the first one where they had a red card um, for, like, the majority of the game. The other ones were just straight up 11 on 11. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, the, and the idea to be able to beat teams, even in the end where they're tacking on these extra goals, how many times in the past, yes, that's already at 4-0, but how many times in the past did we see Philly up a goal and then not being able to kill the game with a second goal in it's years the past? story of the first half of the season, man. Like, yeah. like they look at the, their form from, like, April onwards, they drew something like nine of 12 games and they were a better team and like all of them, they just could not crack it open. I, I agree with you that LAFC, I think, have a slight edge, uh, maybe even more than slight. Yeah, they're up three points. They have a game in hand. But the difference in schedules is is mm -hmm. significant, right? Like, like three of the next four for LAFC are on the road and like, you know, Houston, it should be a three points, but we've all seen teams wilt in summer heat on a random wednesday night in houston man they like, thought like nashville can, was can, hot well <laughs> right to like, houston. like you can you can absolutely beat yourself in that situation and uh austin was not up for it in or sorry lafc were not up for it in austin and then you look at um philly's schedule other than the trip to the red bulls um you know like that's a pretty cozy schedule mm -hmm. like the Philly could very easily take 15 points from the remaining games. And like, granted, you know, Toronto FC um, on decision day, they're probably going to be facing a Toronto team that has blood in their eyes and is like really, you know, needs to go for it and has uh, the type of talent that can hurt you. Um, but Toronto's act, they also have the type of defense yeah. that could give Philly six more goals. Um, 
So I, I it, it's unthinkable. Two weeks ago, we were like, I, I think we all crowned LAFC Supporter Shield winners. I did not. Um, and then but, they lost to the Cincinnati. Philly lost to Cincinnati, and they felt like an idiot. <laughs> So I'm sticking yeah. to what I said yeah, at the right? time because what I said at the time was sort of what Kalen just went to, which is to bring these guys into the team. That's going to throw yourself off. The build is for MLS Cup. Real quick before we finish this off, I do want to just mention Austin's schedule because they are legitimately in this convo. Uh, I think they're a step behind the other two, and then you add this: yep. they host Portland, they go to Nashville, they go to Seattle, they host RSL, they go to Nashville, or they host Nashville. They travel to Vancouver and they host Colorado. So not only are they a step behind on points and all that, they by far have the hardest schedule to close out on of anyone. Um, But I did want to mention them because they deserve to be in there. Now, Doyle, in talking about LAFC and their ability to win and not win, we want to talk for a second about our fast, reliable, secure demon of the month presented by AT&T 5G. And we have to talk here about Ilya Sanchez who has been great when he's been on the field, but his presence maybe has been more noticeable when he has not been on the field. Yeah, and so talking about him this month, it's actually kind of counterintuitive because like, it's clearly his worst month of the season um, because he's missed a couple of games. And oh, by the way, when he misses games, it turns out that LAFC gets absolutely smoked, which is what happened this past weekend uh, in Austin. And it goes back to all the stuff that Kalen was talking about uh, in terms of his ability to get on the ball and be a problem solver for LAFC in possession. Like, he moves the game around in, in midfield to where LAFC want to play, and he gets it to the attackers um, when they're at, they have the biggest advantage over the defense in terms of like being having time and space to turn and play vertical. His ability to be a metronome like that uh, has been so crucial to this team, even when they're not playing pure possession. Like we've seen them go, uh, you know, multiple games in a row playing counterattacking soccer, and his ability to be the first pass out on the break and to put everybody, you know, in on a sprint. I'm not talking about defense splitting through balls, but I'm talking about getting the ball to Cifuentes or to Kellen Acosta in with time to to pick their heads up and you know spray a ball out to the flanks and get guys on the run. He's been invaluable at that. On top of it, um, defensively, you know, nobody is going to mistake him for Diego Chara in terms of the amount of ground that he covers, uh, but he's never out of position. They, they have him in a spot where his primary job is to stop the ball in front of the defense, win the ball, turn, and play. And, and keeping it that simple for him and having guys around him, whether it be you know, out of central defense or the other two central midfielders who can cover a little bit more ground and put a little bit more pressure on, it's just – it's an example of the type of chemistry um, that great teams tend to have. And we've seen it virtually every time he set foot on the field this year. And honestly, if LAFC win the Shield and set a new uh, single-season points record, which they still have a very good shot at doing, I think Ilya is their best shot at MVP. They, they have a lot of other very good players on this team, great players, but Ilya has been their best player this year. I think he is probably been the best defensive midfielder in the league as well. And we saw this past weekend the gap between him uh, and the guys behind him on the depth chart uh, is, is damn near catastrophic for LAFC. I just want to pause a second while Michele Giannone listening to this sheds a tear as Matt Doyle <laughs> joins him in arms for the Ilya Sanchez. I did. I was a, I was a Sifuentes guy for a while, but this past weekend sold me. Michele is right. Ilya, get him in the MVP conversation. Now, unfortunately... Sebastian Gerisi secured the MLS MVP on Friday night against the LAFC because Ilya Sanchez was unavailable. It looks like he could win Golden Boot. He scores in the biggest game of the season, um, but it was a big moment for him. I want to have that take us into now. We talk supporter shield. LAFC in the driver's seat. I think Philly's much closer, I think, than you two, but that's sort of the argument. Let's talk MLS Cup contenders because for a long time this season, it was LAFC and then the pack. I think people felt over the last few weeks, Philadelphia moved into that conversation. Austin FC has to be in that conversation now. Am I correct in saying that? As true cup contenders? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, right? And is Montreal also in this group? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. And and they do. The the issue with Montreal, like, 
Montreal has a game in hand on Philly. They win it. They're two points back. Um, it, the issue with them all year has been goalkeeping. Uh, and, you know, Wilfred Nancy made it a change in goal about a month ago. Mm-hmm. James Pantemis in for Sebastian Brezza. Pantemis has been mostly very good. Um, then he brought Brezza back this weekend for their win in Chicago. Uh, Brezza was very good. So, I, like, they, they don't have an Andre Blake. I don't think they even have a, a, a Brad Stuver. Um, but they don't need guys who are at that level. Uh, they just need to have competent goalkeeping, which they didn't have in the first half of the year, and it's why they're not on 54, 55 points right there with Philly uh, and LAFC. The fact that they have that now, like, yeah, this is they're, – nobody should be shocked if, if Montreal win MLS Cup this season. Nobody should be shocked. We had Victor Wanyama on last Thursday, uh, so if you missed that, go listen to it. Uh, talking a bit about what makes Wilfred Nance special, what it's been like in MLS. We talked with him about Georgi Mihailovic, sort of what he needs to figure out and accomplish in Europe, uh, as well as Ismail Kone, who showed it all this week. The goal and red card combo in the first half. Two yellow cards in the first half. That is uh, efficiency, to say the least, for Ismail Kone, but another big win in Chicago for Montreal. So that is your Sporter Shield race. That is your MLS Cup contenders. I look forward to Andrew Wiebe's best 11 of MLS Cup contenders article coming out later this week (laughs) where he will then take this and just write it up uh, there. Let's go into the other big games because this is the top. Now let's look at the lines. Let's start in the Western Conference. The Portland Timbers beating Seattle 2-1 in the second game on Friday night. Uh, Interesting note here. This sweeps the season series in the regular season for Portland. It is the first time in MLS days that either of these teams has swept their series against each other. So it had happened in USL, A-League, maybe NASL before that. But these two teams against each other, not one team had won all of their matchups in one MLS season. So the Timbers get that, the 2-1 win. It puts them back on the edge of the playoff line. It drops the Seattle Sounders a little bit deeper. And Doyle, I said at the end of last week, that if there was a loser in this game, that they would be out and done in their attempts to make it to the playoffs. I feel, is that true for Seattle? I'll leave you with that. Wait, so you you spit out a take Mm -hmm. last week, and you're asking if I stand by your take. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty much. Shouldn't shouldn't we be asking you if you stand by your take, David? Are the Seattle Sounders eliminated from uh, playoff contention for the first time in their MLS history? I don't know, Kalen. What do you think? Should we try and pull everyone in? <laughs> coward. You absolute cowards. His, his job is to hype the games. That's yeah. important. Um, yeah, I'm a preview yeah, guy, I, uh, not, a, not a post-game guy. This was, I'll say this, I mean, the obvious, this is a huge blow. Um, and then when you couple it with the them being in a, from a winning position the week before and giving up the, I think, 90-plus plus goal to the Galaxy um, the week before, it doesn't seem like they're trending in the right direction, right? Um, that said, I haven't given up um, to say. I just think there's too, there's too much, like, experience in this team to say that they're not going to potentially find a way. Um, I do think they it has revealed how much they miss Christian rolled on. Uh, mm. We saw them move, move a bunch of different pieces around to adjust for Jao Paulo and that defensive midfield position throughout the season. It actually seemed for a moment that Christian rolled on was going to be that answer. Um, and he's just been a guy that you can plug into so many different positions as far as being, you need him on the wing, you need him underneath, you need him, it, you know, in the six, wherever it is. And even in moments throughout when things have gotten tough for this team and the back's been against the wall, they, he's always seemed to find a goal or an assist in an important moment. Um, and they're missing that sort of X factor, I think, right now. So um, it's definitely starting to feel real like it might be slipping away, but I'm not quite ready to, uh, to uh, put that to bed yet. Part of the reason it feels that way is because of the other results around them. Let's go to the LA Galaxy. 2-1 wins, 2-1 winners at New England. We talked about the pass from Pooch. We talked about Chicharito as well. Goal and an assist in the opening 14 minutes after flying cross-country for two games on the East Coast in a week that was sort of in must-win territory for the Galaxy and Doyle. Maybe the biggest part of this game 
is that Greg Vanley finally starts his team in a 3-5-2. Martin Caceres, of course, acquired. He didn't play in this game, but I wonder how much that's in his mind now as he changes his team up and the Revs get a big win. Or sorry, the Galaxy get a big win at the Revs. Yeah, they, I thought the first half uh, was one of the best halves of soccer that the Galaxy have played in a while. But they weren't perfect, right? The, anytime you're, you're facing a, a team playing with a back three or a back five, you want to overload the wings and get those fullbacks forward. And the Revs were able to do that. You know, if Jonathan Bond hadn't had a, a very good game, um, this could have turned out differently. But the, the Galaxy, with the personnel they have, it's just so natural to, to sit in a 3-5-2, um, especially because with Caceres there, like, he seems like, okay, you, you can plug him right into the middle of that back line pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Like, he has the type of experience, he has the type of resume you would expect to see him um, be able to handle that job, like, just being dropped in at his age. Um, the, the weird thing is, though, we've all been screaming, play the three five two because it's a way of getting Chicharito and, and Jovalich on, on the field together. Um, but they didn't, Greg Vanny didn't do that. He started Kevin Cabral up top with Chicharito, um, Cabral didn't factor into into the box score at all, but he certainly was a threat in behind. And I thought, you know, some of his movement um, kind of helped the the Revs backline get a little bit raggedy, which uh, Chicharito and, and you know Puj uh, took advantage of. But it was it was a, I think a belated step in the right direction. But I don't really believe it's here to stay. I. I still think that Greg Vanny is, is going to want to continue to to make the four two three one work. Like, it, it, look, they they went out and they got a million wingers over the past couple of years for a reason, man. Like, they want to make that formation work. Um, they seem committed to it. And, and the good news from a Galaxy perspective is that by getting the three points with their game in hand, um, one of their game in hands, I sh- games yeah. in hand, I should say, they climbed above the line like they're on 37 points uh which has them in seventh place uh but they have 26 games played Uh, everybody else in the western conference is at least 27 the two teams directly behind them portland and vancouver are on 28 (laughs) like so the galaxy have a little bit of wiggle room still to try to figure stuff out it is it was a huge result for them it was a huge performance brugman looked really good in this one alongside push as well as chicharito um, Aguirre, of course, gets the goal. So an all-around strong performance for the Galaxy. You know, just to see what Vanny does. He goes to, back to Toronto for the first time since leaving as head coach now of the Galaxy, which is going to be an emotional one for him. Uh, let's talk about the other games around this that sort of put Seattle and Portland and Vancouver in precarious situations. And one is Vancouver themselves, losing 3-0 at home to Nashville. And Jack Mayer, the two goals offset pieces. Randall Leal, uh, goes about 65 yards before defender even looks at him and they looked at him and walked the other way and then he puts it in off the far post for Nashville to get a 3-0 win on the road I believe this is now 4-0 and 3-0 on back-to-back games in FC Dallas last week so 7-0 goal differential for Nashville um Kalen this was a team that we really questioned over the last few weeks and they've responded in the biggest moments last week it was Hani sort of on his own this week it was back to the to the original drawing board for Gary Smith, which was set piece goals. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of the question that I had on them was uh, around their depth and how they could withstand with different absences. And this game, uh, Zubak started up top for mm-hmm. Sapong. Um, you mentioned Jack Mayer. There's no Zimmerman in this one. I think Dax got a rest in this one as well. So um, Shaq to Moore be able to come rotated. Shaq Moore rotated. Schaffelberg came off the bench. Uh, Schaff Island. So, yeah, I think, yeah, so I think, like, the to be able to get this run of games now where they're getting multiple goal wins, um, the set pieces look sorted, and, yes, I think he, for me, is always going to be Hani Mukhtar, but they've, they've shown, like, a little bit more as far as the diversity of their, um, the different pieces that they can put out there, and I think this team could make a real run. I, I was big on them last year in the playoffs and uh they didn't come up all the way but i i think you know in this western conference there's a number of teams i put minnesota in that same group dallas like i think there's a number of teams that could make a run towards 
the uh, to the cup final. And I know LAFC is is the favorite as we've talked about. But um, Kalen, who did I you pick preseason for Supporter Shield? I think I think it was LAFC. No, I thought it was Nashville. I thought you went bold on Nashville no. at the last. Moment. I thought about it with the away. I think with the yeah. with the ten game road trip. Yeah, I think I did think about that, but. <sighs> Um, but they've been better on the road too, which which has been uh, has been important. I, you know, the other thing to mention was just Vancouver really didn't do themselves any favors. Uh, the Cavallini red card, I expect him to be out. You know, probably you know, expect a suspension for a while um, with that one. It was just a really dirty play, um, and uh, and just in general, like just some questions as far as this team's. You mentioned that like just parting of the seas for lay all to kind of just kind of coast through um but yeah they've they've not been in the best way for the last slant and when i look towards their remaining games like they've got some a a little bit of a tough run too and i was looking back at the seattle's uh sounders uh schedule and they have like san jose vancouver a number (laughs) of teams houston some games that actually line up well for them so with the sounders just behind them if there was a place for them to go up I, yeah, and I understand there's going to have to be some other movement as well for, for them to get in but um, trending in the wrong direction right now for Vancouver it does feel like even though there are teams in between Seattle sort of does control their destiny if they put together the results they have in the past but have not uh, this season for Vancouver this was sort of their best 11 so tough to see this performance Doyle last team in this sort of race although now elevating themselves RSL and FC Dallas 1-1 we talked for a while, six, seven weeks ago, about RSL and just the pure effort and energy wasn't going to fall off as the heat and the summer and the games start to build up. It did for a moment, but now we've seen RSL bounce back and put together some really good performances back-to-back. Yeah, they, they've righted the ship. It, it, it was starting to take on a little water, I think, from what, like like mid-July or like late June till uh, till. Uh, early August they won once one time in like seven or eight games and now they, they've taken five points from three games since then including a pretty huge point on, on the road in in Dallas and like they were you know the, the joke all year long is that you, it, it's impossible to figure out what RSL is doing right other than like trying really hard um, but in this one it was it, like it was easier to, to sort of pinpoint it. Like they, they were swamping Dallas in midfield f- first off. Like Jefferson Savarino was always picking the ball up and the get like Dallas play a single pivot. So there's either to the left side or the right side of, of whoever the D mid is, there's going to be space. You just have to be precise in, in terms of your timing and, and accuracy in terms of getting the ball to the guy in that space and the half spaces. They, RSL is really good at that. Uh, Ruiz and, and Loffelson, that central midfield combo, those two guys are just like, they're really sort of vibing, those two guys out there. Like, they're making each other a lot better on both sides of the ball. And the knock on ability is that, uh, or the knock on effect from that is that LS or RSL have the ability to get on the ball in better spots. Um, they weren't doing that the first half of the year. They were winning anyway, um, but they weren't doing that. But now, over the past few weeks, um, they look like it's easier to point to what they're doing right. Um, and then the other, the, the baseline, though, for what they're doing right from day one has been they hit a ton of big switches, a ton, especially left to right switches that get the ball to, to Justin Miram um, and are off to the races Every single time, like everybody breaks with commitment and then they get a ton of guys into the box. They, they just like, they cross a lot, right? Which is not the highest percentage play. Um, but if you're crossing to five guys instead of four, uh, you, you got a 25% better chance of, of having a good outcome from that. Um, and, and that has been the mix. And uh, that's how you, you go on the road uh, and, and end up getting a really valuable point. RSL, what, they're on 39 points, Mm -hmm. so they're only three points above the line. They do have a game in hand on the teams uh, just below the line that are Portland and Vancouver. So they're not not 100% safe, um, but, I mean, the smart money has to be on RSL once again 
you know, staying above the line and making it to the postseason, uh, kind of against all expectations that I think all of us had heading into 2022. And even though RSL's close to the season is tough, it also means they play the Galaxy and they play Portland, they play um, the teams around them that they can at least blunt their momentum with draws, right? At every every two points taken off the board for those teams is a win for right. RSL. It also feels like, and I don't know when it'll happen, but Danny Musovsky just seems like the perfect player to just give them a shot in the arm of like a little bit more energy, someone new, slightly different look at times, but in the RSL mode of just we'll throw his body at everything that comes into the box. Uh, and it sounds like he's close to starting to be available. So that's sort of the Western Conference. It seems to have gotten a little clearer with RSL and Nashville's victories, especially with Vancouver losing in that game. Let's move to the Eastern Conference. Um, Wait, we're not going to talk about Colorado? Colorado's only one point behind Seattle. There's no chance, right? I think the week you lose 6-0 is not the best time right. to put a team in the playoffs. I, I, think, so. I, I think so, too. Okay. I, think so too. I just want to make sure. Um, but shout-out to Robin Fraser and uh, all the good things they have done in the past in Colorado. Let's move to the Eastern Conference. Um, a lot of teams here that are still in the conversation technically and a lot of big games, a lot of big six-pointers this weekend. Uh, the biggest one, let's start with, I think, Charlotte, the 2-0 loss to Toronto at home. That sticks Charlotte in 12th place on 32 points with 28 games played. They are the only team from 6th through 13th that have played 28 games. So every single other team has a game advantage in them. We'll go through the full standings in just a moment. But for you two, does this sort of spell the end of the road? for Charlotte and does this give you hope for Toronto FC who moved to 10th on 33 points uh, also with 28 games played sorry I apologize for that they're the one other team which puts them three points behind Miami Miami one less game played in seventh place in the Eastern Conference it's gonna be tough for Charlotte at this point um, and no 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 Kalen think... don't do that are they out yeah they're, go they're out okay uh, thank you I'm <laughs> At, at Toronto, I still give a chance, um, and it's because of these Italians that have come in to change to change the picture. Um, and you can just see in a game like this where it's just two moments. Like the the Bernadeschi one is just so. I mean, the technique on the you can pick your poison, <laughs> one, but the Insigne one. But I, I like the uh, Bernadeschi one because it's just like just so casual. Uh, do you like Linguini or do you like Bucatini? That's sort of the debate that you're having right now. <laughs> do you mean Bucatelli? No, Bucatini is a pasta. Uh, Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, no, just looking at the, the schedules, Charlotte, Charlotte's about to jump into the blender, right? Mm -hmm. They're going at Cincinnati, and we know since he's going to be absolutely desperate. They're home to NYCFC, who have not been in good form, but it's still NYCFC. Then they're at Chicago. Chicago's not great, but they've been beating um, not great teams all year long. Obviously, they're struggling against the top teams. Then they're home against Philly, uh, home against Columbus, uh, and then they finish up at the Red Bulls. I don't like Charlotte's had a, a pretty good first year. I don't see a path for them there. Whereas with Toronto, they're home against the Galaxy on Wednesday night. It's maybe a, a must win for them. Then they're home against Montreal, which is a very tough game, at Atlanta, at uh, Orlando, home against Inter Miami, uh, and then at the Union. They're also That's all must wins for them. They, yeah. they really don't have wiggle room left after they've dropped now pretty much four points against the Revs in their two matchups, right? The PK save from Petrovic and then yep. failing to beat them at home when the Revs had to play two homegrowns for the first time. Like they just didn't have a full roster with them. That sort of took away the wiggle room for TFC. But as you say... The first goal was Bernadeschi to Insigne. The second goal was Insigne to Bernadeschi. They have something that most of the other teams in this race don't have to lean on. Um, and it'll be interesting. Doyle, I, I wanted to get your take on, we have seen Jane Nelson play centrally this whole stretch. Uh, now Osorio out. Insigne actually played central for the last like 65 minutes of this game. And Nelson played on the left. Do you expect that that for Bob Bradley is just make sure the game goes through Insigne? I don't know. 
I, I don't know. I thought it was weird. I, I'm not sure it, it worked. I, and I don't love moving Nelson out to the wing because uh, he's got a little bit of barco itis mm-hmm. where, where like he can't just take a touch and, and go. Like he, he always has to stop, play, slow th- things down. And I think that kills the Toronto attack. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, how long is Osorio out? I have not I, seen a I haven't seen anything either. Yeah. They need Osorio back. I think they need Mark Anthony K mm-hmm. back. If they have him, then they got a they got a shot. Um, but it's a it's not it's not a great one. Did we just coin Barkaitis or have you used that before? I, I might have just coined. It's good. It came out it. smooth <laughs> and it was impressive. So, respect for that. Uh, we mentioned Red Bulls 3-1 win over Inter Miami. That takes the Red Bulls out of this conversation as Doyle said for the rest of the year. Congrats to them. It pulls Miami Back into this one, we mentioned, of course, Cincinnati and Columbus at 2-2 in their game. Um, for FC Cincinnati and Columbus, this was obviously a big moment. For Columbus, what do you take away from this game in terms of, Kalen, these two teams' ability to sort of perform or not perform in big moments coming down this stretch? I think it's going to – I mean, I honestly feel like the last – this is going to be the playoff. It's going to come down to these two for me. Um, I just think they're, it's going to come down to the wire. Um, I think, you know, Cucho is, both teams have changed. Cucho has changed this team in a massive way for Ooh. Columbus that I don't think would be in this conversation clearly without him um, to this point. And, you know, the late, the late goal is crushing for Cincinnati. I'll let, I'll leave the instant replay guys to go after the uh, <laughs> the, the other calls, but I just I like this um, Cincinnati team. Ultimately, I, I think the Cincinnati team is I like the assigning of Miazga coming in. Um, I thought he looked good. Um, if Vasquez finishes that one, yeah. <laughs> that center a, a missed center back assist is um, is a, is like doubly painful if somebody like <laughs> curls a left footed ball across the face of goal. <laughs> but I th- I liked what he brought to the to the um, some calmness. I thought his distribution was good. Um, so I, I think you know them strengthening that center back position was really important for them. Um, they've got good goalkeeping. I think they're solid. They made some right, nice additions in the middle of midfield, and then that front three is one of the best there is um, in the league right now. So um, I'm leaning towards Cincinnati, but um, but yeah, this I would say this Columbus team is definitely fighting, and they have this they have a really special goal scorer that can that really changes the picture for them. They I think Cincinnati and Columbus are both likely to get in, and I think Miami is going to drop because as good as Miami's been. Uh, over the course of, of the last few months. Well, first of all, they're playing at least one game right. without Alejandro Pazuelo, which is huge. Uh, it's it's when it's this it's Wednesday away at Columbus. Uh, yeah. Then they're away at Chicago, who are Chicago sounds out, like, but they're going to be. It sounds fighting. like Iguain might be a question mark for this Wednesday as well, too. Well, they yeah. So there you go. A six pointer in, in a in a playoff race like that, um, and like that's good news for Columbus as well. Uh, so anyway, Miami is at Columbus, at Chicago, home versus Columbus, at DC, at Toronto, and you know Toronto is going to be you know screaming for points at that point. Home versus uh, Orlando City, that's going to be a six pointer, and then home versus Montreal. That's not it's not the toughest in the world but with like three of the next four on the road missing you know at least one dp perhaps two like it it could get real ugly for them as soon as this week like wednesday night it could be all of a sudden oh man it's panic time for Miami. and one thing to add on miami that orlando game is midweek before decision day because it was rescheduled because of the open cup right. final they will be the only teams playing so they will have to deal with fixture congestion that week that no one else has to deal with, which may be nothing, but also Iguain's old and Pasuelo and whatever. So just something to note. Uh, on Cincinnati's side, Kalen, you mentioned the strength they have. Mazzarita was cleared to start training last week, so he could be back at left wing back for them as they go forward, which they've used Barrial at for a while. And obviously for this Hell is Real derby, Nobodo suspended on yellow card accumulation, trying to set records just straight out the gates. 
which I respect as a DP, <laughs> make your presence in MLS. Um, but he is they obviously a difference finish maker. With Chicago. Cincinnati finishes with Chicago and DC as our last two games too, which I think Ooh. I like. I like. Well, that yeah. is a dessert like, like, at the end of the meal. Just, just, just looking at it, like Cincinnati's next two game or next three games are home against Charlotte, and then at NYCFC, and then home against San Jose. If they take care of business in those two home games, and then they take care of business uh, home against the Fire uh, on the second to last day, I like that's a pretty clear path. Even if they don't take anything out of the other games. Okay, so. Let's just run through the standings right now, and let's start from the bottom then in the conversation. I'll start with Columbus is on 36 points, 26 games played in sixth. Miami is on 36 points, 27 games played. I put them in seventh. Um, that is the line. Seven teams will make the playoffs in MLS this year. If you haven't gotten that from the last 55 minutes of us yelling about playoff spots and standings. In eighth is FC Cincinnati, 35 points, 27 games played. So one point behind Miami on equal games. The Revs sit one point behind them in ninth on 35, 34 points with 27 games played. TFC is one more point behind in 10th on 33 points, 28 games played. Atlanta United, after their 3-2 win over DC United, they are equal to TFC on points with only 27 games played. So a game in hand on Toronto and then Charlotte in 12th on 32 points, 28 games played. And Chicago rounds out this list in 13th on 30 points with 27 games played. Kalen, you took Charlotte out of the running. I assume for either of you, you feel the same then about the Chicago fire? Yeah. Yeah. Chicago's out. Charlotte's out. Is anyone else out as of now? I think Atlanta's out. I think even though they've got the game in hand on TFC to then potentially, even though they got the game in hand, they're at that game in hand is at the union on Wednesday. Uh, Then they're at the Timbers. Then they're home to Toronto. Then they're at Orlando city. So three of their next, and then they're home to Philadelphia. So three of their next four are uh, away games and two of their next five are at the hottest or against the hottest team in the league in the union. in the history of the like, league. Just to be clear, in the history of the league, yeah. I think Atlanta's in trouble. Yeah, Kalen. Yeah, I agree, uh, I, and that partly because I'm feeling mo- the more we're talking about it, the more I'm feeling better about the teams that are above them. Whether it's Cincinnati, uh, Columbus. Now I recognize they have that game in hand as well, which is lining up against an inner Miami side this Wednesday that seems uh, wounded at the moment. So, um, but I do like this Miami t- team. I feel like when I, when I think of one of the teams that have been in the best form over the last passage, whatever month or so, they've been able to get good results. You see Iguain smashing set pieces, Campana's coming back. Even when I think with Pozuelo out this week, uh, Duke has been good in moments. And this is sort of a big opportunity, I would say for a young player that's, at a certain point seemed to be a part of this sort of uh, really good moment that, that they came into. So um, I like this Miami team. I still think they have a real good chance at the playoffs. Um, I, and I think I would ultimately push them in. Um, but TFC is the one that uh, New England's disappointing for me. I, I would lean towards them being out. Same with Atlanta. Um, just like it was massive for them, like do or die basically against a DC team, but they had to come back twice. And I just don't know if it's going to be able to consistently mm-hmm. find those moments. And, um, but TFC is the one that I'm kind of still holding on to because it's the newest, it's the most change that's happened to a team, um, with these signings coming in. And if they, as you guys mentioned, if they can get those guys healthy, like especially Mark Anthony Kay and also, I just feel like that'd be huge. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that one still, but, um, yeah, I, I think Atlanta United is is probably on on the out, but it's also like we're going through and trying to do this with seven games left in MLS and the way how crazy, you know, yeah. you never know what's gonna happen. Like, it's, it's so also please don't check back in on this. Every time we do it, I felt very comfortable like you, Kalen, last week. I felt Inter Miami had the lowest, had the highest floor in the way they perform in games, and that was going to get them in the playoffs. That's not the case if Pasuelo is not on the field. That's not the case if Iguain's hurt. And so the one team in this whole group I felt comfortable with 
had their best player get red carded, lost. Now they're in a must win, potentially right. without their two best players. And that's how quickly this whole thing shifts. If Atlanta steals a win off Philly in this process, that throws everything to chaos as well, which as we saw Charlotte did at NYCFC two weeks ago, these things can happen and it really jumbles everything once again. Um, but right now it seems like for all of us, it's 10 through six that are truly with the opportunities from TFC up to Columbus rather than sneaking Atlanta into that convo. Um, shout out to Orlando who have kept themselves out of this conversation once again with the stoppage time winner through Tesho Akindele. Now back to back games where Tesho gets, they lose to, if they lose to, to Seattle on Wednesday, they're right back into the Don't conversation though, aren't they? Don't do it. No, I'm just saying uh, if, they, if they, they like, they have to take care of business on Wednesday against a desperate Seattle team. Eh, I don't know. Atlanta's going to lose in that game. There's a chance TFC drops points. I wouldn't be shocked if Orlando lost and still we felt comfortable about them. And, of course, we are okay. a little over a week out from the Open Cup final um, for Orlando City. Uh, some other results to mention. Or do you guys feel good about the East? I'm not holding you back here. Yep. I feel good. You don't want to write your name in Sharpie next to any teams that are going to make the playoffs before I move on? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right. Well, let's close out in the mailbag here. We didn't mention Minnesota. Their 2-1 win over the Houston Dynamo. A big win for them. Another big comeback. But this does bring us to our mailbag question, which is from Nick, avid listener. Great to meet some of us in St. Paul for the All-Star Game. And he says, with Bakaye Dibasi out for the season, which was the news that dropped uh, over the course of the last week, there's been talk among Minnesota United fan base about a possible move for John Anthony Brooks. I'm curious about your thoughts on this. On the positive side, he is a free agent who needs playing time and wouldn't take up an international roster spot, but he's expensive, would likely be a TAM player, which doesn't seem like a good idea for what's essentially a Band-Aid signing. So what's your thoughts on, one, the loss of Dibasi, and two, this as a potential short-term solution? <laughs> two diehard John Anthony asking Brooks, me? Fan, Brooks fans. You asking Kaylin? Uh, I don't know. I would say if you can... Okay, Kalen, go. I mean, with losing Dubasi is Dubasi is huge um, because he's been uh, really great for them in the back. And you know, I, I don't think I'm not a, uh, into going and making a, a shock signing. But for me, if you can get John Anthony Brooks in MLS as a center back, we've seen teams invest more heavily in center backs, um, even up to the DP level. And find I, I brought up Miaska coming back. We've looked at the way Zimmerman has been elevated to a dp we'll see what happens with long but for me if you can go get john anthony brooks that's a piece that would be fantastic for them um so i i wouldn't look at it as just a one year signing even when you look at his age he's still mm -hmm. i think what how old is he do you guys 29 know? to like 30 29 30 Anders yeah. is so in like here right a, now so i can't say ages because i don't have anyone to correct me <laughs> a great age so yeah for me that would be a no-brainer if you could go get john anthony brooks uh back in that for for them it fits a need they also want to push for playoffs if they could get them sooner than later if they get them right now i would say it absolutely um yeah click yes on that one uh doyle do you feel that i mean i guess the question is is he the right guy and then the other question I mean, would be how much would you commit to trying to be better this season to your long-term future uh I, I think if you can get John Anthony Brooks on a TAM deal, max TAM deal, absolutely do that. I, I would even consider, you know, offering him a, a DP contract if, you know, if that's what it, it took. It, he's, he's limited in certain ways, right? The, the, the reasons that Greg Berhalter didn't like him for the national team is that um, he, he kind of lacks the athleticism and open field defensive ability to, to play in a, in a pressing system. Um, but that's okay because <laughs> – Minnesota, Minnesota United press. only pr they they press selectively, right? Like we've seen them press really uh, successfully, but they don't like it's not a pressing team. And you know, anytime you get a, a center back with that kind of uh, ability to distribute with that left foot aerial dominance, it seems like if if this is legit, and we're not saying it is, this is just some random dude sending us an email <laughs> like a mailback question. Um, like if this is on the table, you're Minnesota and you have the ability to do it. I think you do it. 
there are you know there are reservations. John Anthony Brooks has never handled heat very well. Like there's a reason why he was maybe the worst defender I've ever seen the U.S. put on the field in qualifiers in Central America. Anytime it's over 75 degrees, he would wilt, and I w- would worry about that. Um, but not enough to stop, not enough to stop the signing. Like it would be, uh, it would be kind of a home run of a deal. Uh, for Minnesota he, at this point. He is not a random dude. His name is Nick. I don't even have a last name. That makes him not <laughs> random. And my technical director, Kalen Carr, and my GM, Matt Doyle, and I won't explain the org charts so neither of you know who's boss and who's not between the two of you, they both sign off and say yes, and therefore, John Anthony Brooks is headed to Minnesota on a Max Tam deal to close out the rest of the season. Let's finish out with this email. Uh, Jared in Milwaukee says, inspired by Doyle's recent article, I had an alternate history question. So I believe, Doyle, you did a piece last week where you put one club legend who has left the club back on their team for the rest of this season. Yes. Uh, Doyle nodding his head, as all podcasters tend to do. I said yes. (laughs) I said yes. I know. If you could extend... So his question on alternate history is this. If you could extend Dax McCarty's stay on one team of his past, which would it be? And he gives 2017 and 18 Red Bulls, a Dax Tyler Adams pair is the platonic ideal of a double pivot. They win CCL. Mm -hmm. Am I right? His other is 2011 Timbers. Dax Chara duo behind Valeri is the best midfield in major league soccer. Does it even matter where Nagby plays? And then FC Dallas life for 2016, 2006 to present Dax leading that midfield for nearly two decades, a club legend helping youngsters like Kellen Acosta and Pax and Pomichol. Maybe in heat, he and hedges leading things keeps things more consistent. Your other options are you could extend him on the fire after he left or DC if you'd like. I couldn't make a great case for either, so I chose the Red Bulls uh, instead. What do you guys say? I'll let the former uh, Metro Stars supporter speak here. <laughs> I mean, any of those any of those are great. Like the the idea of a decade of of Dax, Chara, yeah. and <laughs> Valeri wild. in Portland. <laughs> like that that would be maybe the best midfield in MLS history. And they could like all three of those guys stayed mostly healthy for uh, the subsequent decade. So that like that one there, but like there, there's, we don't get it a lot in MLS, but there's something very romantic about like the one, the one club player. So with Dax, especially because uh, Dallas have been sort of hit and miss with their D mids over the past decade. Um, it would have been really natural to keep him and then slide him back to D mid when Danny Hernandez was moved on, I think after the 2011 season. Uh, and if he had been kept there, uh, you know, Dallas's floor gets a lot higher and their ceiling gets a lot higher as well, just because he's, he, he's maybe the best D mid in league history, hitting those third line passes two feet in the pockets. And um, the, you know, there's a reason that he's what 35, 36 years old, and he's still playing at such a high level. Uh, and has, you know, I think he's he's made the playoffs all but one season that he's been in the league, and that's even though Damn. he spent some time with the Chicago Fire, you know, which wow, is wow, uh, wow. yeah, degree I'm of difficulty. Cut you off there, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> just, but I will say, yeah, he, he 2006. I was a part of the same draft class as him, so the fact that he's wow. still going, I've been retired for about 100 wow. years at this point. Um, so it's incredible (laughs) his longevity the idea of him continuing to do that with Dallas does sound amazing that said I feel like when he when all is said and done I think he's going to be remembered as as a Red Bull legend um, amongst uh, amongst his career and so the idea of getting him I still remember when he was traded I think we were in uh, LA at the draft and we were everyone was kind of shocked and so I think the idea that he uh, could have spent a little bit longer there and still been a part the way rosters are have more flexibility in them now would have maybe allowed for a player like Dax to not move on for a Tyler Adams or play together longer or to see that relationship um, grow even on the pitch at the same time as opposed to like or you know replacing one for the next so I think if I had to pull one I would I would pull the a little bit more time with uh, Red Bull because I feel like that's where we saw like you know the best Dax um, and a really like amongst some really big players and around them, he was a, a key, key piece to making that whole thing work. 
I mean, in retrospect, Dax could and should have been for the Red Bulls um, what Ali Bedoya has mm-hmm. been for sure. the Union. Like, we think of the union is a play your kids team and they very much are, but their captain is like 35, 36 years old, has an engine that does not stop. Doesn't look like he's anywhere close to retirement um, and has been there forever. And, and Dax, I think in retrospect, uh, if the Red Bulls could do that over, I, I, I think they would like, you, you would have to get a do over on that one. If you're the Red Bulls. It is fascinating to think about all of them as options. The credit to Dax is probably all of those clubs would like. Yeah, him. like there's not one club. <laughs> yeah. Like, like the the dude was like, oh, I can't make a good case for DC United. It's like, yes, you can. They've won the wooden spoon like four times in the past decade. If you have Dax, you make the playoffs. Like that is the case for DC United. Just putting him in that spot as the number six for the past, you know, since 2011 when he had that half season with DC. It's like it's like the best case in terms of uh, which team you could you could leave them they with. They also would have had a spine of Hamid, Birnbaum, and Dax for eight or nine years yeah. that a team that was pure flux and chaos would have had that to sort of yeah. build around. When Rooney came into the team, they would have already been there. Lucho Acosta, how much better could he have been playing in front of Dax that whole time instead of, I can't even remember. Um, yeah, all of it's fun. So thank you to Jared for his email. Thank you to Nick. Thank you to all of you out there. Uh, who send us messages and are a part of this show with us. Andrew Reby will be back on Thursday to join us um, from his, I believe he's pulling a, an Anthony Hudson. He's going to sit at the foot of a great manager and learn and study <laughs> at all moments, not Bielsa specifically. There's less flights, but I think he's talking to a pretty special manager that will have his interview coming up here on ETR. So thank you to you, Kalen. Thank you to you, Doyle, for being with me and Dan Hilton out there producing for us here today. And thank you all of you out there for listening. Have a good one. And we'll talk to you again soon. Congratulations. You made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.